wherever you are there. I uh, want to thank tonight's guests. Uh, we've had um, Mark Latham, but he's had to pop away. And uh, you can follow them on Twitter, where you'll find everything else you need to, the links about their other offerings. Uh, you've got John Anderson AO, Real Mark Latham, Tweet Corin B with a double R and one N, and Joe underscore Hildebrand. I have to spell it out for the podcast. Uh, but uh, that's it. So thank you very much for watching and we'll see you in the comments section. But uh, now Barramundi, great name, said Premier Palachuk is acting outside the realm. It's hard to spell, but a little bit of effort wouldn't have hurt. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, is we've that got Palachay? a. Uh, yeah, I think it is. Um, <laughs> We've got a sponsored question here. It would uh, be nice to respect. Thank you, Joe, Joel Jamal, for the uh, five bucks. Question for John, and this looks like a great uh, segue into overtime. Um, feel free to not limit this to 60 seconds, John. Uh, how do we reverse the long march through the institutions? Uh, where to start? Um, in a way, I'm not sure that you can reverse it. I think they've been right through the institutions and come out the other end. So maybe what we've got to do is start at the trail end somehow and uh, institute a march of reason, logic and calm, other person-centredness, uh, humanity through the institutions uh, in a spirit of goodwill and genuine inquiry, all of which seem to have been missing. Um, it's worth noting, of course, that that march was quite intentional. And for a long time, I didn't use the, word, the term cultural Marxism. I sort of thought, oh, that's corny. And people say, oh, don't be silly, you're dreaming. There's no such thing. But I don't see why we shouldn't use it because, of course, you know, the people involved in um, cultural Marxism have called it that. Uh, from the Frankfurt School through uh, Gramsci and his followers. And the intention was quite clear. Um, the working classes weren't going to bring on the revolution quickly enough to overthrow capitalism and install communist nirvana. Uh, so we had to weaken the West to hasten the whole thing on. How do you weaken the West? Well, you march through the institutions and destroy them, break them up, the universities, the churches, you attack marriage, uh, you undermine confidence in parliaments and the judiciary. And boy, oh boy, that's where we've got to. But maybe the re-emergence of a highly visible sort of vision, I suppose you'd say, of communism in full, full throated um, authoritarian mode will cause a lot of people to rethink. I'm not sure I'd be too keen now getting up the university campus and openly identifying myself as a communist. I mean, I'm surprised there are any left anyway, but mm -hmm. there are. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, you know, people now will be asking a lot more questions. Yeah. Joe, uh, being a lefty, is yeah. the uh, long march through the institutions uh, necessarily bad thing from your perspective? Um, oh, yeah, God, definitely. Ask I'm definitely less of a lefty than I was. So I, I was a, a student socialist in the, the 90s at Melbourne University and I foolish assumed, foolishly assumed once I'd sort of gotten over it that everyone did and I was... <laughs> quite surprised um, to, to learn uh, really only in the last few years that there was actually quite a pervasive sort of strain of, of it still going on and there was a, a seeming ignorance. I mean, I'm obviously deeply embarrassed. The more I obviously learn about um, what communism has actually done to the people it's ever gotten control of, um, I've been incredibly mortified to think that I'd sort of you know, I was I was I was a classic Chardonnay socialist, if you like. Except I couldn't afford the Chardonnay. I was a beer swilling socialist, and you know, <laughs> mostly I was just in it for the parties. But but I, I think there, there is there is a um, there is an understandable rebelliousness of youth, I think, and 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 it expresses itself in all different ways. Some kids um, do drugs, uh, join gangs, uh, become socialists, join ISIS. Um, it's I don't think it's any surprise that that when you have especially young men in the, the you know the, the last sort of throes of um hormonal adolescence that they they seek to rebel against whatever institution they were raised in what's what surprised me are, are a couple of things one is um 
uh, baby boomers and, and relics of uh, the 60s and 70s who still adhere to this, uh, adults who should know better who are still uh, gibbering on about it. And the other is, I suppose, um, the pervasiveness of social media. I get the sense, I don't know, but I, I get the sense that there are actually a whole bunch of people not like me who um, actually didn't sort of go through the motions of student unionism or student activism or whatever it may be, who actually hear about these ideas for the first time via Twitter or Facebook and say, hey, why don't we just like, you know, have a universal wage for everybody or why don't we just make, you know, X billionaire be it Warren Buffett or Bill Gates or the ones you don't like, you know, just give away half their money and everyone will have it. And you, and you get these weird uh, confluences of, of far left and far right ideology, like the the, the, the one percenter movement is a, is, a, is a classic example of the Occupy Wall Street movement had outsiders on both sides of politics, overwhelmingly radical left, sure, but also um, plenty of people who were um, right-wing enough, uh, so, so right-wing as to oppose society altogether. I mean, there's not a huge difference between extreme anarchy and extreme libertarianism, I guess, if you like. And and hmm. and, and it's no surprise that a lot of Sanders supporters were, were, were Trump supporters. Again, the same sort of people who think you have to tear down society to start again. They can't necessarily agree on what you start it with, but they both agree on the tearing down. And then I guess once it's all smoking rubble, they'll they'll figure out the details. And these are the sort of um, mindless thugs who are able to get much more influence in an age where everyone uh, can spread whatever they want to say. And, and certainly the, the, sh the more simplistic and, and simpler you know, the message, the easier it is to spread. So, you know, basically the dumber an idea, the faster it runs. And 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 that that is the sort of thing we're dealing with now. I, and, and I think this, the centre parties, the mainstream centre, centre left and centre right parties also have a lot to answer for because they, you know, while there was a sort of broad uh, agreement on what the sensible way forward was, I often say all governments actually look the same. What sort of happened was this sort of pyramid structure where, you had people from the left and the right coming into the fold, coming into the system, coming into government, power, business, the usual appointments, whatever it may be, sort of rising to the top and basically just forgetting about everyone else below them. And and people were being left behind on both the left and the right. People who were, you know, working class people who just want to take care of their jobs, who were once Labor voters who work in a coal mine and then find themselves being shouted at by hippies from a thousand kilometres away who are telling them that they uh, don't deserve the right to put food on their table because the the planet they're, they're killing the planet. You know, I mean, this is this is a, this this is the sort of thing that we're confronted with. So you have um, an age in which um, simplistic politics is able to to capitalise on very very genuine grievances and the moderate, uh, intellectually sound, if you like, or rational centre-right or centre-left of politics has lost touch with its base and actually has no base. And that's what I think you're kind of seeing. I don't know if you know the, the rebel symbol in Star Wars, but it's kind of like a, a bird with its head <laughs> up here and the wings coming up there. Well, the wings are sort of coming up and they're starting to peck at the head. And, and that, I think, is what we're seeing in politics now. I don't think it's any coincidence that we've... The rise of social media over the past decade has also coincided with all these mass groundswells of, of populism that have seen things that no one, none of the, including me, I'm not, I'm not exempt from it, but no one in the intelligentsia or, or the, 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 the system, the press gallery or the mainstream party saw coming. Trump, Brexit, uh, Bojo, you know, ScoMo coming back against... Uh, all odds, not not to mention the implosion of both Labor and Liberal parties, where not a single Prime Minister ever managed to serve a, a first term, and mm. even even in countries where there hasn't been a, a populist right or left movement to 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 smash the political norms, you've seen brand new centrist or 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 brand new movements like in in the Liberal Democrats in um in the Liberals in in Canada. The, this new on march party in France, um, Germany again. You, you've seen a massive rise up at the far right uh, with Le Pen. You've also seen, you know, in Austria, you see we saw I think a presidential election 
where the Greens were going against the far right party and the the Social Democrats and the centre right party were nowhere to be seen. Yep. I mean, you cannot look you cannot look at the past decade and think that something extremely volcanic is going on and and it's probably not an exaggeration to say that this sort of um, uncertainty and these sort of rumblings, these nationalist rumblings or populist rumblings, I would say probably haven't been seen since just before the Second World War. I'm not saying that's going to be the outcome or whatever, but I'm saying that you haven't seen sort of socialism versus fascism being talked about as actual concepts. Yep. I mean, it's insane to me as a child of the 90s where, you know... If you'll forgive me for interrupting, uh, yeah. just I want to oh. pick up your point on, on socialism and I want to ask Corin um, to comment on these comments from Stephen Shavira. Stephen's a uh, speaker at the Church and State Summit and uh, a great mind. Um, and this is an interesting comment, um, Corin, which uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on. Um it's probably something I would instinctively uh, balk at. He says it's one thing to be a socialist which has a strong Christian tradition behind it. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know about that. Uh, it's another to be a Marxist which is driven by hatred. Uh, he then goes on to say Marx hated Christian socialism. He thought it was utopian because it wasn't violent. Um, and... Then he says, I realised that the Marxist ideal of a society in which everyone would freely share was bollocks when the Marxist student union ref refused to back voluntary student unionism. They didn't even believe that the people would voluntarily give to the cause. Um, what What are your thoughts on that, Corin? <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there, isn't there? <laughs> there is, there is. There really is, and we're back again to... Um, the politics of hatred, aren't we? You know, we, we, we've come back to that. I actually wanted to pick up on, on um, something from the point before about the um, leftist march through institutions. Can I just say on that point, um, we really need to start somewhere. And, you know, if, if you look at um, when coronavirus first arrived in Australia, one of the um, emergency experts was saying, if you wait for the perfect time, um, or make, if you wait to, to get your response perfect, then it will be too late. And I think in some ways we can kind of apply apply that to, to all of this and in the same way as we're having conversations about Marxism. Um, we have to start somewhere. So we have to start speaking up when we see ridiculous comments. We have to start speaking up um, against socialism. We have to start speaking up when we see this green left um, socialist agenda being smuggled into other issues um, and if Mark was still here he, he would probably drag that back into um, domestic violence yet again um, talking about funding um, but yeah we have to make a start somewhere sorry I've rambled <laughs> that's okay John what's your thoughts does socialism have a strong Christian tradition behind it uh, well I think it does actually and I think uh, Joe should take comfort from the fact that in many ways uh, some of the most noble people I knew, actually, in the parliament when I went in the late 80s, to my way of thinking, were the lefties who believed in universalism. Their view was that the Labor Party existed, the best of them, to elevate the, the poor, the oppressed, the marginalised, the disadvantaged, the unrecognised, up into, if you like, full membership of the Australian family. Uh, that's now given way in the Labor Party, I think, in many ways, to identity politics, the game where you actually create a new aristocracy. The more points you can uh, gain in terms of intersectionality, uh, you know, uh, you, you tick this box and that box and so forth to be a genuine victim, uh, the more aristocratic you are. And so you now, instead of having this view that we ought to be, if you like, universally the, of the same family, we have a new class of aristocrats. Um, uh, so I would have disagreed with their solutions, but I would have seen their objectives as often um, um, indeed uh, quite uh, noble. It's, it's worth remembering that um, uh, if I am correct in my memory, and I'm very, I know I'm pretty close to it, in 1891, the first time the Labor Party stood as a party, stood candidates as a party in the New South Wales Parliament, Something like 32 or 33 members of the Labor Party were elected uh, and over 20 of them were from um, 
evangelical churches, Presbyterians, mm. Congregationalists, Baptists, Methodists. Uh, they were profoundly Christian uh, and they were seeking a better way to address what they saw as an unequal and unfair society. But they were doing it. I think uh, uh, the, the, the comment was made that they're doing it out of love rather than being driven by ideas of class hatred. No, there were many who strayed over into class hatred in the Labor Party, no doubt about that, uh, and that was always a tragedy. But I think um, the, the distinction is well made. In fact, all three of the major political streams of thinking in the West had, to greater or lesser extents, Christian roots. You could even say, frankly, you probably say that of the perverted outcomes like communism, but the democratic socialists believed, I think, in a universalism. Uh, the classic liberals believed that government should be there only for the essentials, that a civic society would neither want nor tolerate big intrusive government. And conservatives believed that government... Uh, well, the most appealing thing about, um, about the conservatives, I think, is that they're the one political creed where you find that it's the adherents believe that human nature never changes. And I think that's very wise. Uh, an understanding of human uh, nature is critical to realistic policy outcomes. As one American put it, we're so good we had to give ourselves a vote. We're so bad we had to give ourselves a vote. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I do accept the very sharp distinction, if you like, between communism and other forms of authoritarianism uh, and the various Western traditions, including that sort of centre-left universalistic socialism as opposed to the class warfare type of socialism. Mm. So my disagreements uh, with the, the Labor Party as a young backbencher had more to do with um, what I thought were their, their, their policy blindnesses in terms of achieving their objectives rather than the objectives. Does that make sense? Yes, it absolutely makes sense. And and I think I'm a, um, a sort of uh, old school Irish Catholic kind of Labor guy, a very bad Catholic, probably the the second worst Catholic in the country after Barnaby Joyce, and, um, <laughs> and 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 that is very much what I think. I think the key to um, I, I did go through a year where I read nothing but books about Jesus, but um, the, the the key is Christianity and socialism are are indeed very similar. As long as they weren't and, written by Christopher Hitchens, no, they were not. They, they, they were not. They're very, very, very interesting ones, and and very thoughtful ones about the historical Jesus, and and I suppose you, you could be forgiven for calling Christianity something like voluntary socialism, and I think that is that is one of the the key differences. Uh, obviously, Christ said, "Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and render unto God what is God's." But it's the it's the you could also call Christ. socialism compulsory Christianity. Uh, you, in, a, in a sense, in a sense, you could, but I suppose it's not. Um, it's not Christianity if you don't really care, and that's the and that's the key the key message. You you give away the rich man gives away all his money because he is convinced that it's the right thing to do, and he knows that it can do more good for those he's giving it to. We are on the even, verge even of the a very bit of very top, deep philosophical theological very deep conversation. Philosophical territory. This is what I live for. This is why I had my second glass of wine. Um, very, and Jesus is also very fond of that too. Um, but, well, viewers, we're going to go into a third hour with no, just me and Joe. No, we're, we're coming to you now from one AM and uh, Eastern Standard Time. But the rich man, you know, maybe there is some self-interest there, and I've always believed in Paul Paul Keating's axiom that always back self-interest because the only horse you know is really trying. But um, <laughs> the, you know, maybe the rich man gives away his money because he thinks it's the only way he'll pass through the eye of the needle and get to heaven. Um, but he he does it because it's the right thing to do, not because the state forced him to do it. In fact, Jesus is quite clear on that. He said, look, if you have to do whatever the state tells you to do, fine, whatever. But the important stuff, the stuff that is really going to save your soul is the stuff that you have to choose to do yourself. And I mm -hmm. work with a lot of charities, a lot of um, Christian charities, and, and you do it because you want to do it and because you know it's, the right so Christianity is socialism uh, without the government. It, it, it is, and and it's, it's socialism in some ways without the organisation. But it's also um, socialism without the the reason why I love the Catholics is because they they look after you know the, the wretched, the poor, the people who no one else cares about, and that that's why I've always loved 
that particular church. It doesn't adhere to that sort of slightly nouveau uh, evangelical idea that, you know, whatever I've got, it's because God willed it and because he wants me to be successful or whatever it is. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of self-flagellation in Catholicism, which, which actually appeals to me that, you know, that we oh, are really? all sinners, we are all sorrowful, no matter how, and that we should all feel guilty about whatever it is that we have. And, <laughs> um, and, and You know, that no, actually, uh, like actually that. it's not at all unique. I think it's very, very human to want to earn our salvation. I think it's quite the most mm. offensive, well, maybe not the, but one of the offensive ideas of Christianity is that Jesus completely paid for it and it's got nothing to do with you at all, which is offensive to our pride. We, we want to have some control over it and contribution to it. Um, That's right. And pride is obviously in itself a sin. But, um, <laughs> but yes, that's absolutely right. A good deed. I, it's, it's good. I once uh, sat down with George Pell before any of the, um, the, the charges or, or claims uh, against him were, were known. And, and he was so hardcore against this. He, he was absolutely convinced that no human being could ever do a good deed of their own accord, that it all had to, to, that it all had to be done as a vessel of God. That he was so, I mean, this guy, he's pretty hardcore. And, you know, that we're all sinners and we're such sinners. And because, because the minute you do something good, you know that you're going to feel good about it. And that therefore ceases, uh, ceases to make it an altruistic act. The, the, the fact that you feel any joy in doing a good deed um, immediately negates the fact that it's a good deed and therefore that good deed itself belongs entirely to God and you can't take any responsibility for it. That's how, that's how yeah. hardcore he was. But John um, Anderson, chip in. What do you think about what I had to say about uh, pride and salvation, etc.? You looked like you, you, you had something oh, on the tip yeah. of your tongue. Uh, well, you see, I'm, I'm always struck by C.S. Lewis who said, humility is a great virtue, pursue it with all your heart. But understand this, the minute you think you're making progress, you know you're not. Um, <laughs> you also said pride is the, the, at the heart of every human failing because uh, it prevents us from looking up and seeing something greater than ourselves, uh, the cross, uh, and it makes us look down on others uh, rather than seeing them as fellow human beings. And at some point, one of the most disastrous sort of shifts in Western values over the last 30 or 40 years that has undoubtedly, in my view, followed the collapse or the rejection, not the collapse, the rejection by so many in Western Christianity, has, and it's very noticeable in Australia, I'm afraid, and it saddens me to say this, has been a switch from the idea that humility is a virtue to one that says pride is a virtue. You know, mm. it shows up everywhere. And you think of Donald Bradman, People used to talk about the man's character as much as anything else, about the astonishing modesty in victory and graciousness in defeat. Um, uh, what, what happened to that? Uh, mm. And it's something about the people you admire. They're not proud people. They're people yeah. who are humble, people who are grounded, people who are sober about their own qualities, uh, strengths, weaknesses and place in the world. Um, yep. And uh, I think there's nothing more appealing than meeting people who are great contributors in no matter what realm who are not on themselves. Mm. I really identity politics, by the way, you see, has at its heart an unhelpful pride. I think that's um, true, I have to say and the, the pride and, and the pride for, for, for something that you've actually not done yourself. Like I mean I could I could not be less proud of myself for being white or a man or straight or yeah it's any immutable of the, any of the things that i just happened to to, to come out as I, I can't think of anything less prideful uh, or pride worthy i should say you said, it's, well, um, it's, it's, it's baffling to me that this is this is the new bastion of the the hard left but this is extraordinary so we're rebuilding a class system yeah, yeah. I, I i i agree well, and i i, I think it's yeah. worth noting on the, the subject of things like cultural marxism or whatever that may be, none of this is being driven by actual poor people. None of this is being driven by the actual disenfranchised or forgotten people, the people you'll see in, in Blacktown or Mount Druid or where I grew up in Danong or Elizabeth or, you know, Logan. In Queen none of these people are talking about cultural Marxism. None of these people are, are talking about, you know, identity politics. They, 
could could not be further from their concerns. It is it is people who are actually quite privileged or at least privileged enough to have gotten to university who then need to find some excuse for justifying their anger or, or claiming some form of oppression so they can then... Which is a symptom of the wonderful their job ideology. our ancestors have done building this society. We've done so well at eliminating injustice and inequality and, and barbarism uh, that we now have to invent uh, problems and and look for something to occupy uh, those people who want to fix everybody else except themselves and fix the world around them. We're, well, we're I'd creating. I'd put it another way. I would I would say there are actually still very very real problems and a very real underclass in society, but it is certainly not the the vocal class that we hear crying oppression. It is it is certainly you know as I said um, to much outrage over a, a different debate um, or in fact the same debate some time ago that these these people aren't on Twitter they're, they're not Joe, the ones going on about how bloody offensive everything is they but Joe, they have the, the, the real problem here is that they have no voice you know they That's right, they yeah. There, there is nobody speaking for them, and you're right. We are we've we've gone full circle, and now we're at the point where we are creating classes, um, and we are creating new things to be aggrieved about. And again, bringing it back to um, feminism, <laughs> we um, you know we really see it there. They've they've run out of things to fight for, mm. and um, they've just become increasingly um, shrill now about less mm. and less. Um, and yeah. and I think that's. That's identity politics in all of its forms is creating new problems. It's exactly what you were saying, Joe, earlier about outrage. You know, that mm. it's creating things for, for people to to worry about new new problems. We're in search of new problems. Mm. Well, the dark and the, the darkest irony is that um, we haven't actually run out of things to to fight for, but we're just not fighting for them. And so, you know, if you look at things like shutting down schools, that is going to screw up the most disadvantaged students the poorest students uh they're the ones who are going to slip through the cracks and get left behind and yet you have supposedly progressive labor governments supporting the shutdown of schools and, and consigning these kids to oblivion just ask the smith family yeah. ask 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 world vision ask any anyone who works in this sector and i, I you know i work with charities in this space i ask the ardock youth foundation you know my mum works as an integration aid in one of the most disadvantaged schools in in the country they know what's happening. They know that once these kids, it's hard enough to get them to school in the first place when schools are mm. up and running and all hands are on deck. You shut them down. It doesn't matter if you say, oh, no, it's all right. If you're really disadvantaged, you can still come. You think the neglectful parents say, oh, yeah, no, we're the disadvantaged ones, Mr. Premier. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll keep coming. I mean, honestly, how naive and stupid do you have to and out of touch do you have to be to think that, that that's going to happen, that the, the, one, the kids who are already on the slipperiest pole are going to be the ones who are still the last ones going to school after everyone else has left. I mean, that is, for anyone who cares about education or poverty or disadvantage or child welfare, that 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 is just the most horrendous, idiotic uh, position you can take. If, you, if mm. I mean, we've spent generations trying to make sure that the most disadvantaged kids go to school and then in one fell swoop because of the whims of a few panic merchants and, and completely unqualified uh, political lever pullers, we just say, oh, we're just going to shut them down even though there's no reason to. And so what if we leave a generation of kids behind? I mean, that's what makes me yeah. sick. And that is, that's what makes yeah. me... <clears throat> it's heartbreaking because ultimately what we're doing is creating incredibly long-term problems. Um, and I think the, the really heartbreaking and really sad thing is that people don't actually, they don't realise they're so obsessed with with the here and now and the lockdowns and, and you know, the emergency of and, and this whole culture of alarmism. Um, but we're creating problems that we're going to be stuck with on many, many fronts for a very, very long time. And you're absolutely right. Le leaving children behind, that's, that's long term consequences we're talking about. I think one of the big injustices that's entrenched in our systems and, and legislations and, and, and it actually completely uh, invalidates my claim before that we've sold everything. Uh, we, we've actually started destroying our culture with uh, our failure to promote marriage and family, specifically uh, empowered motherhood. Uh, we now fund the destruction of our children instead of the empowerment of our mothers. 
uh, we instead of solving the problems which are, are causing uh, fear and pressure, anxiety, and a perception that there's only one choice, instead of solving those things, we throw all our money at just killing them. And I, I think, uh, I think it, it's the greatest blight on our time. The single biggest thing I want to see changed in my generation, and it won't take an election cycle. So it'll, it'll take a generation, is to uh, abolish pro-abortion candidates like we abolished pro-slavery candidates from parliament. It's just reprehensible. Like we're, we're talking about uh, euthanasia legislation in Queensland at the moment, at the other end of the spectrum, um, devaluing the sanctity of human life. Uh, and all it really takes to solve the suffering problem, because it's not a life problem, taking the life isn't going to take the problem away, it's just going to end everything. Death isn't therapy. But um, we, we're seeing in, in today's news, I saw fantastic suggestions that a uh, hundred million, less than $200 million could be spent on palliative care funding. Well, this is exactly where we should be doing. There's so many solutions we could be providing instead of taking, taking the, the cheap, um, morally violated way out as a society. And I think that's a damnation on us. And you know what? Forget the government solutions. Quite often it's just coming down to us. What are we doing to help a woman who's you know, considering adoption or abortion because she feels she can't be a parent right now? I would not agree with that. I do have concerns about euthanasia um, because I think there would inevitably be social and economic pressure on selfless older people to, to want to... Um, to say, oh, don't worry about it, darling, I'll just slip off. Um, and I also um, uh, find it ironic that there's a lot of pro-euthanasia people who are also say that we must save 95-year-old lives at all costs, no matter how much yes. it destroys the rest of the um, society. But, mm. um, but, but look, it, on, on your first point, I would just say um, I'm also very pro-marriage and I'm pro-same-sex marriage as well. And I, I think marriage is fantastic. And I think anyone who can be a part of it and raise kids in a loving environment, uh, should be encouraged to do so. And so, um, you know, you say pro motherhood. I, I certainly agree, but I would say pro fatherhood as well. I think fathers should be absolutely uh, more involved in their kids' lives than perhaps has traditionally been the case in the past. And I'm, I'm certainly trying to be. And um, and I, I think everything should be uh, focused around the child. I think we certainly agree on that. And that that's another reason why I've been very very passionate about um, schools reopening and, and, and kids' well-being being at the centre of that. I've heard a lot of talk, a lot of talk about how safe kids are, how safe schools are for everyone except the, the children who go to them, who they're meant to be for. That's all I'll say about that. Just on that, Joe, just don't you think it really underlines the elitism again, people who were saying that giving disadvantaged children technology um, giving them devices, um, that was going to be an answer, uh, uh, like a solution to schools being um, schools being closed, yeah. as if as if that's the magic the magic wand to wave over it. There, there's so much more um, to the lived experience of of living in poverty yeah. than being given a device, as if that magic and, and some data. You know, I, I just find that so incredibly offensive. Yeah, I'd say two things. I'd say, yeah, absolutely. I'd say certainly um, online teaching is no substitute for face-to-face -face teaching, absolutely not. And if you don't believe that, we'll just have an online relationship instead of having a face-to-face -face one and see how much you love your girlfriend or boyfriend then. Um, and uh, the second thing I would say is that, uh, that even if it is, there are simply kids who don't have that technology. There are simply kids who don't have an iPad or a laptop, don't have Wi-Fi in their homes. Um, no, the Smith family is working with about 50,000 uh, disadvantaged kids who they're deeply worried about. Um, some of them may not come back to school. Uh, many of them will but won't catch up because they haven't had the same intensive learning at home that uh, middle class and upper middle class um, families have had or, or families where one parent can afford not to work and, and concentrate entirely on homeschool or whatever Jane Carrow calls it. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and that is, that is absolutely right. I know father Bob, uh, another uh, rogue Catholic friend of mine is desperately scrambling to get poor kids. Um, now he's a lefty. I'd love to get on the show. He would he's, be. He's, 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 a, 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 he's too like busy doing the project. A, he's a bit of a rogue unit. Um, <laughs> he's, 
It Maverick lefties. I love them. Fit the mold. <laughs> but um, again, anyone who works in this space, and there have been countless studies, I can, I can point you to them, um, done even even in the wake of, I think there's at least, I think, four or five I can think of off the, off the top of my head, which have been uh, hurriedly conducted since the pandemic began about children falling behind. So these are not just hypotheticals. This is actually um, people are calculating the cost on the run. Um, it just shows that the, the poorest kids are the hardest hurt. And for the love of me, I cannot figure out why anyone who calls themselves progressive or calls themselves left wouldn't be focused most on the poor, most on the children. I mean, that is, if there's any such sure. thing as Christian socialism, surely it's that. John, I want to bring you into the conversation here because uh, comments have blown up with our uh, gracious <laughs> lefty joining us and and uh, voicing a support for the undefinition of marriage. I, I won't call it anything else. Um, but uh, would you would you care to uh, I guess summarize or, or represent a a um, efficient rebuttal uh, for for Joe to consider perhaps how he may have misthought this with, without reliving the uh, two year old um, plebiscite? Uh, I am deeply troubled by the idea that we should take it upon ourselves to determine that some children have their mother and father, their biological mother and father, and others don't. I, I, I'm sorry, I just I just think that I don't, I don't see how you reconcile what we know now from the science about the way in which children relate to their mother and their father as an ideal. It can't always happen. It doesn't mm -hmm. always happen. But I do not see how you can move away from, move away from it as an ideal. And we know now of the extraordinary importance of fathers. We know from the research to children. We know. I mean, you can't get away from it. You just cannot get away from it. And surely we're not going to say that it's ideal to create fatherless families or motherless families as um, in, in the face of what we now know. Uh, and um, I just commend a book called The Boy Crisis, not written by a Christian person at all out of America. Uh, the unbelievable problems that young men now are facing in every sense, including employment. Uh, and uh, he's, even the extraordinary reality now that in 147 out of 150 of America's biggest cities, women in their 20s earn more, have the better jobs and earn more than men. Uh, and so uh, increasingly uh, those women don't want to take on somebody who can't protect or provide them because actually they're doing better. Uh, and then the, the, the men spiral into self-doubt and off into all sorts of addictions and bad behaviour and self-harm. Um, I, I think we need to be a little more honest about the needs of our children. I recognise that there will be howls of protest over that, but, but I would not want to take it upon myself to say to a child that it is perfectly all right not to give you the best shot of living with your biological mother and your biological father. It has a huge amount to do with your sense of place. We know that both play very different roles. Love is important, but there's a heap more than love. Here's a simple reality. We now know from the research that children learn how to um, deny or delay gratification overwhelmingly from horseplay with their father. Mm. I, I've got to say, John, I completely agree that fathers are incredibly important. And as I said, I try to um, be as, as present and active a father. I horseplay with my son uh, and my daughters all the time. Um, but I, I would just say that, you know, that there is not really any such thing as an ideal family. The idea of uh, to, to create an ideal family is quite a totalitarian idea. Families happen organically. They happen imperfectly. And I think wherever they happen, where... Um, there can be an abundance of love. I, one of the organisations I, I newly work with is Adopt Change. Quite frankly, there are biological fathers and mothers who are, you know, I'm not sure if we can swear, who are pieces of shit, who abuse their children, who neglect them. We've seen, you know, possibly another example of that. And, and, and yes, in a perfect world, maybe everyone would have a mother and father, but we don't live in a, in a perfect world. And I would say um, any, any love is better than, than none. But again, I don't want to get an argument. I'm, I'm in broad agreement with you. 
I really have to push back. I've just got to push back and I've got to push back quite firmly. I, I, I just have to say to you, we know what the ideal for healthy living is in terms of food, in terms of exercise. Do we not strive to say those things are important, that we can't deny the ideals, we need to get to as close to them as possible, or do we just say, no, go and eat a Maccas because that's what you feel like? I, I really have to say, for the sake of our children who are our future, as Edmund Burke said, uh, life is a contract between the dead, the living, and the future. We need to think more carefully before we go bringing children into the world. Um, you know, they are voiceless. Current talk about people who don't have a voice. Our children don't have a voice. I've, I've got. I've got to say, I, I just can't agree with that. I know. I know many, many people with many kids with two mums or two dads or whatever it may be, and often a combination of um, of all the above. And and these are people who have, have often strived much harder to have kids because they really wanted them and really wanted to to raise them and love them than a lot of um, traditional male female combinations who just had them for for no reason whatsoever so i hey joe um, I am, uh, quick I am a question good, i'm a good catholic boy but not quite good enough a quick question uh to, to i guess we, we don't want to get bogged down here forever um no, no, no. there's some good points mate but <laughs> lyle lyle asks a pointed question lyle shelton um joe tim wilson supports commercial surrogacy so homosexual married men can acquire children do you yep commercial surrogacy uh if i i think if any child i'm i'm a little bit uncomfortable with commercial surrogacy um for obvious reasons and um i don't think it's actually technically legal in australia yet i'd have to check but i i believe that it has to be voluntary but i, I understand one of our federal the, mps uh the, wants it to be the, the people circumvent that anyway well yeah I, th I think already it sort of happens where they you know bestow certain privileges on a person and it's not technically a transaction but look mm. again having um having dealt with uh having having looked into shall we say i won't get too far into it but having look looked into this could be a lot issues of around child welfare child mm. disadvantage um children living in the the most appalling circumstances in this country and overseas any oh, my, my my preference would be for adoption my preference would always be for taking a child who is in harm's way who is living with parents who cannot or will not take care of them and sometimes actively harm them my preference would always be for taking that child and giving them a loving family be that gay straight purple people eater whatever i don't really care the child must come first and i think there should be some consistency there if you really care about children you want them to be loved you shouldn't be preoccupied with who's loving them and um and and so that would be, always be my preference but to be honest i can also understand the the primal desire to i'm a, a father of three myself i love my children more than anything else i would die for them without hesitancy and and i can understand why you would just want um that more than anything and and why frankly maybe it's vanity maybe it is pride yep. but why you'd want that child to be a, a sort of reflection of yourself and and i, I think part of our idea of immortality that christian idea maybe the, just that human idea of of your soul going on or yourself going on forever i think a lot of that is tied up in in children and having children and having them go on and caring for them and knowing that when you die yeah that they will be there so I, I think that's quite a beautiful idea and so i wouldn't begrudge anyone that is it not just well, ego Pello joe sorry is that not just ego yeah probably but uh, human human beings are uh, egotistical people. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, we we all you know, we're all sinners, as the good books. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just I just I just have to point to you, uh, remind you of uh, the. Uh, just for uh, everybody's um, sake, we're going to let John wrap it up. The anonymous uh, uh, sperm donor children. Forgotten what their title was in the Senate inquiry a few years ago, expressing deep dismay that they didn't know who their father was, had no contact with him, therefore felt that a great part of themselves was missing. Mm. I know that's a tough thing to say, but there they were. Later on in life, long after, people had had children because that's what they wanted, those children expressed dismay about not knowing their biological father in those cases. Mm. I mm. just think it would be 
Well, I, I have very deep reservations about this, and I, I cannot buy this argument that we hear all the time that because there are children living in bad circumstances, that's a justification for a different form of family. I think the that is a justification for saying we need to again hold up the ideal and encourage people to move as close to it as possible for the sake of our children. By any definition, we need to face something. We are not a child-friendly society. If we were a child-friendly society, the stats in a whole variety of areas would be very different, including the depression, the anxiety, and the self-harm numbers that are emerging out of our young people's yep. uh, uh, yeah. numbers. We've had a, uh, a couple of... Um people, I guess, in the comments section, uh, wishing that there wasn't a lefty preaching to us about the benefits of same-sex marriage. Uh, but I, I promised well, I'm a this... heterosexual, white male, Catholic lefty, so I'm, I'm, about, as, I'm about as harmless as you're going to find. I, I so appreciate you coming on, Joe, and, and I hope Absolutely. you do again um, because this is not Q&A um, and we actually do want to hear the other side. And uh, unlike q and I, I think you, you've heard a balanced represented side of, of both um, on, on that. And I love the disagreement and I want to hear the other side and, and give people who disagree with me the opportunity to persuade me I'm wrong and, um, and have that opportunity reciprocated. Um, that's that obviously right. a big topic that we could, we could take a, a lot longer. But, um, I, yeah, Joe... Um, Huge gratitude for uh, for coming on and uh, oh no no uh, it's been an absolute pleasure anytime. Love, I'm I'm love sorry to, for the um, fact that you're going to be called literally Hitler tomorrow I because will be you came on a right <laughs> ring show. It's very strange being a lefty when the right love you more than the left does. But anyway, <laughs> this is the brave new world that we all have to become accustomed to. Yeah, well, right. there's, uh, there's, there's right. quite a few. Sorry, John, we lost that. Say that again, please. I'm just saying, if, if I had my way, we could all go out now for a friendly beer. That's right. Well, soon we will. Inshallah. Inshallah. We'll soon be able to. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'm, for, I'm afraid uh, Corin and I aren't allowed to leave Queensland. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, John and I are not allowed in. That's right. We're working on that. John and I are working on that. Maybe we'll get, maybe we'll we can. to make another couple of calls. He's not, <laughs> he's, not, he's not getting any from the Chinese ambassadors. So uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll we can meet at the border. <laughs> Uh, yeah, awesome. exactly. uh, so look uh, to the viewers I, I'm sorry you got subjected to some left wing shows you thought you'd found a safe <laughs> refuge from uh, right. the uh, national broadcaster here but uh, I, I look we don't long want an march. echo chamber we always sneak in <laughs> that's right it's the long march coming <laughs> I, I promise you it's not that there is no money in Pelo Talk at all <laughs> they're not interested um, uh, look uh, there's a um, Dylan's saying, Dave, show us your Braveheart video. On Pellow Talk, on the on the youtube.com slash Dave Pellow, uh, there's a video uploaded today uh, where the script was written by um, a, a supporter and uh, he provided the voice characterizations, etc. It's about four minutes, a little bit long, and because of technology failures tonight, I can't show it, but it's essentially a four-minute spoof of, of Braveheart in Scottish accents talking about uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk um, repelling the invaders from the south, uh, a bit like William Wallace, and uh, it's 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 done very poorly by my video skills. Um, but uh, I think the script alone is, is worth watching, and the Scottish accents uh, are beautiful. And uh, it's called Brain Fart instead of Braveheart. Um, but uh, yeah, hope go check it out on um, Pello Talk. Oh, sorry, uh, what is it? My YouTube channel again? YouTube.com slash Dave Pello. Head there, have a look at that, and. Uh, yeah, look, uh, may there be many more lefties. Put in a good word for me with Father Bob, will you, Joe? I shall, Dave. I shall. I'm sure he'll forgive you. He's forgiven me. Uh, I want to bring him on and, and convince him he's wrong. That's all. Um, but uh, I guess the, the opportunity has to go both ways. Corin, who do you think uh, you know that we can invite on to uh, the Pellow Talk live? Let's get it's... Clementine on. Let's, let's sit down and have an actual discussion. You and her best friends? I'm more than happy to have a, a, a calm and common sense, rational discussion about true equality. I would actually really enjoy that. And we can broaden it out to talk about family. We can broaden it out to talk about respect. There's all sorts of... Have you got um, her phone number, though? 
funnily enough, not so much. Um, we, I'm Clementine, sure if you're happen. watching tonight, you're invited. If any of your <laughs> friends are watching tonight, please uh, let, let her, uh, her let her pop in. Um, we've just lost Joe temporarily, but uh, hopefully he'll be back. Um, John, um, what's your uh, what's your thoughts? Who should we have on Pillow Talk Live? Uh, preferably somebody you've got the phone number of. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, let me just make this general observation. John Stuart Mill uh, said something to the effect. I would love to have him on. Yeah, well, it, mm, that'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Clairvoyance, anyone? <laughs> um, but he did say that no matter how strongly you hold a view, if you've not understood the opposing view, that view is of little value. It's incredibly important for us to talk to Thank people you. about yep. it. And what a delight uh, to, uh, to disagree with uh, an intelligent and thoughtful bloke like Joe. Uh, and to recognise in the end uh, our shared humanity. Mm. Yep. Here, here. Yeah, very good. Uh, cool. Well, Joe, we've lost your face. It says you're still in the stream um, and, and available. I don't know if you can hear us or, or speak, um, but uh, I'll switch to just me now anyway. And um, thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Corin. Thank and um, thank you very much to the viewers for joining us tonight. It, it's been uh, long. It's been fun. And, um, yeah, it, it's been really great having you along for the ride. Apologies about the uh, technical mucking around for the first 15 minutes. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you in the comments section. And uh, just watch back on the show and details beneath these clips on how you can get more from Pelo Talk. Thank you and good night.